Welcome to Leading with Curiosity. Command and control leadership is dead. We interview leaders, entrepreneurs, and executive coaches challenging old paradigms and fostering cutting edge leadership. Here's your host, certified executive coach, Nate Leslie. Hey listeners, welcome to Leading with Curiosity. My guest today, Stephen Gaffney out of Washington, D.C., really caught my attention when this opportunity came across my desk with the wide range of experiences over three decades and some massively famous clients. I don't know if you've heard of them, like Marriott, uh, World Bank, the Congressional Budget Office, Department of Homeland Security, U.S. Department of the Navy, Citigroup, NASA. This is a great conversation that sparked so many ideas that I've been thinking about lately through great conversations and other episodes. Uh, his new book, Unconditional Power, is out in September 2023. This idea of really taking control of not only your life, but your role that you play inside of teams, whether you're a leader or in an organization, in your family, on how to get the unsaid said, how to be comfortable in uncomfortable spaces, how to get the most out of your team through that. It just He's got a confidence and a strength to his uh, voice and demeanor, but uh, through the stories that you'll hear throughout this episode, a real passion for helping people move from where they are now to where they want to be, acknowledging the past, but really focusing on what we're going to do about it, how to get to where we want in the future. No further ado, enjoy the episode. Stephen Gaffney, welcome to Leading with Curiosity. Thanks for having me. You know, I got to be honest, when it came across my desk, the opportunity uh, to interview you, what really caught my attention was decades of experience in a variety of industries from private, from big corporations to uh, NASA to government to military, just just a, a breadth of, of life experience and a really interesting personal background as well. It's just an honor to have you here. Thank you for having me. And you know, yeah, I really do appreciate it. Well, and coming from a diverse background or you know, dealing with different clients is really important because I think there's a lot of experts that just focus on one industry in this, and the problem is they suffer from incestuous thinking. And I think that happens with a lot of industries, right? And instead of realizing that one industry can really help another industry, and I can give you some examples of that, where I've said things from another industry and people said, I never really thought about it that way, but I can give yeah, you yeah. Yeah, let's go there right away. I'm curious about the, the human element and, and what you have seen in, in, your, in your time in this work. Well, so I'll give you one example. So uh, Marriott is a big client of mine, and, um, and they are founded with the principle that if you take care of employees, they'll take care of the customer. In fact, they don't even call them employees. They call them associates. Now, that sounds, and it doesn't mean that Marriott doesn't care about customers. They care greatly about customers, but it's an and, not an or. And you might say, okay, well, that's kind of true about a lot of industries, but here's the big difference. Many industries burn out employees because they're so focused on the customer. They forget to take care of the employees. So by calling, by Marriott calling their employees associates and actually treating them in that way, in that way, it's no accident. They're the number one hotel chain in the world. So I'm a huge fan of Marriott, and it, that principle is really applicable to all of us. So right away, we have to ask ourselves, how well do we treat our employees? What do we call our employees? You know, are we always focused on the customer and forget about taking care of our employees? And if we don't take care of that resource, then ultimately it doesn't help our customers out either. It's, that's an example. Yeah, that's a great one. I, I, I really like that idea that it's a bold statement to actually be willing to say out loud customer can't always come first. Our people need to be there in order to be in service of the customer. Yeah. Well, here's the thing. It's true about ourselves. Think about it this way. You know, people want to be helpful to other people. And I've coached a lot of executives that I like that are, they don't necessarily take care of themselves at the sacrifice of maybe employees and customers. They're just burning the candle at both ends and, 
And I say to them, listen, if you don't take care of yourself, you cannot take care of other people. I mean, just think about this, how it applies in life and at home. If we don't take care of ourselves, we can't help our significant other, our kids, our friends, our family. The best thing you can do is really make sure to take care of yourself. And I'm not talking about like self-love and all that stuff. I mean, that's fine. I'm talking about just doing the fundamental. How about exercise, eating well, and just and taking care of issues, right? You have an issue with somebody, get it resolved which we can talk about. But the whole idea is we have to take care of ourselves. We have to take care of the people around us in order for them to take care of and us to take care of other people. It was exactly that that only recently let me let go of a guilt I'd been carrying around for a long time as a self-employed uh, entrepreneur for many, many years where we always feel like there's somewhere we need to be. But when I finally gave myself permission to say, hey, if I can take care of myself, I can serve those around me, my my wife, my children, my clients, uh, more impactfully, uh, which is, is I, I was wrestling with in this flexible work environment, like me, number one, my family, number two, my clients, number three. Yeah, and people can hear, oh, well, won't that sound selfish, what we're talking about? The answer is no. If you really want to take care of other people, you cannot help other people unless you take care of yourself. I mean, because then we're not around. Or if we are around, we're not we're not dealing with this well. Here's an easy example. You don't get enough sleep. We don't get enough sleep. We're not as quick. We're not as uh, responsive. We're not as thoughtful. We're not as caring. We're more short fused. So we're really not helping anyone. So you could even look at sleep patterns. And I don't mean to make this only personal, but I'm saying really when you're thinking about work and our work environment, how, you know, how are we taking care of the people around us and setting up our work environment so ultimately we are in service of the mission and we accomplish those goals? Those are things to consider, but everyone's focused on the bottom line. And you can't focus on the bottom line if you don't think of your line and your, your, the people around you. So this is a great segue because yeah, I'm, I'm listening to this environment where people can thrive. Uh, your latest book, Unconditional Power, A Formula for Thriving. Tell us about uh, what's coming here and, uh, and how it came to be. I'm really excited about it. So it's soon to be out. It'll be out probably, well, it'll be out September 12th. But here's the key. It's called Unconditional Power because I have found out and through all the work and I've been at this for almost three decades, that most people live in a conditional world. A conditional world is where they say, I can get that done as long as that person comes through, as long as I have more resources, as long as I'm giving uh, more um, uh, um, ways to handle things, as long as there's more money, as long as somebody else behaves in a certain way. So what we're doing is we're powerful, but we're conditionally powerful. Mm -hmm. The idea of the book and what the book is all about is how to be unconditionally powerful. It doesn't mean that powerful people and we're in that powerful mindset and being unconditionally powerful. It doesn't mean we don't recognize the conditions. We do recognize the conditions, but we focus 100% of our energy on what we're gonna do about it. Just think about how often somebody will say, I, I'd be happy, um, I could be happy if I had a better boss, or you know, that person's making me unhappy. Well, I'm not saying they're making you thrilled, but here's the thing, you gotta take, you got to take control of your life. There's only one key question you got to ask yourself, what are you going to do about it? What, how am I going to respond to this situation? Because here's the interesting thing. When we blame other people, which is we all do at times, right? We get, you know, we just blame, we get upset. You, it, in the moment, it might feel better, right? We get to complain and bellyache. But you'll notice that that issue crops up again and again and again, because we're giving away our power. But if we say, what am I going to do about this? It shifts the whole focus. So the book is about how to be unconditionally powerful. And there's nine specific strategies about what we can do and how, and this is the interesting part for a lot of people, how do you persuade other people to be unconditionally powerful? Because how frustrating is it to deal with other people who are conditionally powerful? You're a leader and you want people to do something and they say, well, I can get that done as long as I have more resources or as long as that other department comes through they may be legitimate conditions, but they're focused on others rather than focusing on what we are going to do about it. So it's how to inspire other people to be unconditionally powerful. Tell me about the moment where you realized that this book needed to be written and that you just had this burning message inside of you that you needed to share. Well, I'll tell you, it's really interesting. It was actually um, traced back to the early parts of COVID. 
And what happened was, is I was talking to another consultant of mine and, uh, you know, friend of mine and a good buddy of mine. And he was saying about how, you know, mindset and mood and perspective really impacts things. And I started to be reflective, you know, COVID was such a horrible experience for so many people. You know, I don't want to downgrade that experience, but what's interesting is some businesses pulled through and many kind of dealt with the situation by what I would say being un unconditionally powerful. But anyway, we were talking about this and we talked about mood. And in full disclosure, I've suffered from mood, right? You know, where something might trigger me and then I get sad. I mean, I'm not, I've never been clinically depressed. I don't mean it that way, but I get sad. And then, you know, and I'll, I'll pull myself out of it. But I started to realize something, and this is what started me on the journey. When we're in a good mood, we're smarter. Have you ever noticed that when you're mm. in a good mood, when I'm in a good mood, we're smarter. And so I started to explore what triggers us to be in a good mood? And what do we do when we're not in a good mood to get back into being in a better mood? And that led to the powerful and unconditionally powerful state. So I started to explore what are the strategies that I use on myself and with others just kind of instinctively to kind of snap out of that mood. And how do you get people to be powerful? And that's how that started on the journey. So, I mean, the truth is it started a long time ago, but the big trigger was during COVID that I felt like, this really needs to get um, uh, written about and talked about because the whole idea is when we're in a good mood, we're smarter, we're more decisive, we're um, better friends, we're, we're more caring. So our mood really matters. And that's the whole thing. Mood matters. So the book is about also around mood mastery. You know, when you think about it, not manipulation, but really, you know, jumping, you know, jolting us back into being in a, in a great state, a great mindset. I'm, I'm hearing a correlation too between when we accept that we have the ability to choose how we respond to a situation, when we focus on those things that we can control, the people in our lives that do that well are often also more optimistic, more positive view. They are acting with that unconditional power that you're speaking of. Am I picking up what you're laying down? Absolutely. Absolutely. Choice is critical, but there's a step before it that I think we overstep and forget, and that is awareness. So sometimes somebody might say, I'm going to choose to complain because I think it's going to be effective, or I'm letting people be, I'm just telling the honest opinion, but they're only saying the negative stuff. And so awareness comes into play because we become aware of how this is landing with other people. So I do a lot of work, and in the book, there is this whole grid around pessimistic and optimism. And what we found out is optimistic people are more successful than pessimistic people. That may sound obvious, but sometimes people think it's, you know, glass half empty, half full, it's how you view it. But actually, optimistic people are better. And the reason, and they are more productive. And that's because when we're aware that it's important to not only say what's on our mind, but then also suggest ideas and be optimistic. It's actually advantageous. So awareness comes into play because some people are aware that they can be negative, but they're not aware of how ineffective that is as a strategy. So they don't choose to be more optimistic because they don't think that that's that important. But when they learn things like what we cover in the book and what we're talking about now, that awareness is a huge aha. Oh my gosh, I'm bringing other people down. Being pessimistic is not an effective tool. So if they become aware, then they can choose differently. So awareness is the critical step before choice, because otherwise we're going to make bad choices. So we've got to be really aware of what's going on. Connecting a thread here that we picked up in the pre-interview, a lot of your work around honesty and hard conversations. So if we can bring this back to an organizational situation where we've got, where we've got a team and we have the naturally optimistic people who can more readily gravitate to that unconditional power. And then we always have a few who also are getting in the way of that. How, when you work with clients around this topic, do you find it effective to be able to have the conversations about naming, being aware of what, of what we're seeing here and how it's getting in the way of the team? So here's what I found out. Um, there's two things I want are really two critical points. First, the biggest problem in all communication, in all relationships, in all teams is lack of honest communication. 
But what I mean by honest communication is not the truth or lies. The biggest problem, and if people forget everything out of what we're talking about, this is the most important point. The biggest problem is not what people say, it's what they don't say to each other. And so it's really important to get that unsaid said. And so it is important when we're talking about teams, we're talking about organizations and as a whole with communication is to really get that unsaid said. Then the second primary point is we have to not only just say what's on our mind, right? But then what's our suggestion? Because if you ever met somebody who does get the unsaid said, but they don't say what they want, like, hey, I'm just being honest. I just want you to know this. And you're like, okay, I appreciate that. But what's your suggestion? You know, what do you want? How do, where do we go from there? So it's really important because when you look at, at um, situations, honest communication is really the backbone of all successful organizations, but it's really around getting the unsaid said. It's really connecting these themes then, getting the unsaid said and taking that step to say, to be proactive and what we're going to do about it. Is that right? Absolutely. Yeah. And then now people might say, how do I be proactive? What do I do? Well, that's important to think about the other person. So there's these 12 essential elements I figured out and, and teach around creating high achieving teams. And one of them is be them. Be them is not our ability to establish rapport. It's not just about connection. It's the ability to really be someone else. So think about it this way. You have somebody who's really challenging in your life to deal with. We all have had those people and we'll have those people. Well, often they, I can't understand why they're that way. Well, the first step is to try to understand why they're that way. Be them does not mean agree with them. It means our ability to get over in their world and get what might be going on with them. And that's why, you know, talking about like our, what we said before we got on the air, so to speak, and started the podcast, you said something so brilliant around listening. We spend more time transmitting than we do listening. So part of the irony about when I'm coaching people to have difficult conversations is I encourage them to first go ask a bunch of questions targeted questions and really listen so that you can be that other person. Cause if you can be that other person, then you can connect it. You can resolve issues. And then when you have suggestions going back to, you know, making suggestions, you're framing the suggestion by not only what's in it for us, but what's in it for them. Mm. Listen first and then finding next steps that are not only self-serving, but also, what's in it yeah. for them. Yeah. So I do an interesting exercise that really, um, um, when I say, I, I want to say it throws people off, but in a good way, it really jolts their mind. I'll say, write down somebody who's having, you're having a difficult time with. Now, I want you to partner up and I want you to be like you're uh, in a press conference. Only you're the person, I want you to be the person that you're having a difficult time with. So get out of your world and pretend that you are that person. And the partner's job in the session is to ask you a bunch of questions and see how you can answer it. And they're basic questions. I want, and I teach them, I want you to be asked, you know, what are your goals? What are your biggest challenges? What's most important? You know, things like that. Just a few things. And you know what? People are, st they're, they're stumped. Mm -hmm. They start rambling because they realize I don't even know what their goals are. I don't know mm -hmm. what their biggest challenges are because we spend so much in our own world, but yet if we really want to connect with other people, want to resolve issues, we got to get over from our world into other people's world. I mean, look at society right now. And, you know, and I, I actually believe we live in the best time ever. I do. You know, it's much better than it was years ago. And we have medical breakthroughs and all kinds of great stuff. And still, you know, there's so many conflicts because people get so regimented to their point of view instead of spending time in other people's point of view. But it doesn't mean agree with them. It means to get them, to be them. One of my favorite things about Leading with Curiosity is getting to hear from super interesting people who are spending their lives thinking about solutions to problems and finding these through lines and connections. Uh, in Jay Shetty's latest book, Think Like a Monk, he talks about the mind being like a studio apartment, a single, single occupancy apartment. It's just you, Stephen, living in it. So whatever's in there, it's your fault. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I pictured, I pictured while you 
we're describing how, how how much we don't think about we haven't thought about what's in that other person's apartment we just know that they're over there and <laughs> and they're frustrating us and we're actually we're actually letting them frustrate us rather than exploring and and thinking learning through that through their eyes and 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 and, and finding creative solutions anyway i got a, got a laugh out of you there what connection do you make between that and and, and your work well, so here's the, so I love it. Um, so one thing that comes to mind is having worked with a lot of admirals, generals, CEOs, and top executives, the best ones when faced with a problem, blame themselves first. They take responsibility mm-hmm. first. The worst ones blame others, right? And so mm-hmm. when you think about it, it's, well, why people might not like the word blame or whatever, but whatever it is, take responsibility because here's the thing. It's a strategic reason to take responsibility, full responsibility for that studio apartment or wherever, you know, our surroundings, because we get back in the driver's seat. A lot of people going back to this unconditionally powerful book, the way I like to draw the distinction is unconditionally, excuse me, conditionally powerful when we're, I can do that as long as or whatever, is like we're in the front passenger seat of our car. But unconditionally powerful, and what this um, mm-hmm. what this person saying that you were describing in his um, in his book and his work, it sounds like is getting in the driver's seat of your car. It doesn't mean there aren't going to be traffic jams, um, potholes. There's got to be a lot of things we got to deal with. Mm-hmm. They just don't. We're not ignoring it, but we got to figure out 100 percent of our energy and what we're going to do about it. So, if we are back in the driver's seat of whatever we we are responsible for, what we're creating in our life. Then we get in the driver's seat and we can do something because the only person we can control is ourselves. I mean, just think about it. The only thing for sure you can control, and people might be very spiritual and all kinds of things, but the only thing you have 100% certainty that you can control is yourself. And people might say, but there's so many challenges out there. But yeah, there are, but there's so many ways to influence others. But the first thing is to influence yourself. And so taking responsibility for what we're about and focusing on us about what we're going to do about the situation. Practically speaking, when you work with a client, how do you integrate work like this in, into the time you, you spend with them? So a lot of the work I do is with successful organizations. Often people hear and they say, I bet you get brought into organizations that are really messed up. Well, and you probably experience this, the people that often need it really the most, they don't seek it. But, and you might say, well, then what, <laughs> what do we do, right? Well, people who are really great at what they do or have a high drive for success, and they recognize we all have challenges and they're always getting better. I mean, look at the greatest athletes, greatest teams. They always have coaches. They always have people that are, are, are trying to make it um, better. So the work I do a lot is with organizations that are either number one, organizations that want to be number one. They're striving to move it forward. So we've uncovered all kinds of issues, and sometimes they are major, major issues. But the idea is to help them work through it. So one of the ways we work through things is by people not having to dissect the past which is an interesting thing Mm. because a lot of people think I'm going to be brought in and we're going to have this this team guy come in and he's going to, you know, get us to talk about the past. And then we're going to have to hash out the past. But here's the thing. I think people spend way too much time assessing and dealing with the past. Yes, we need to draw the lessons learned, but here's the thing. We are where we are. What are we going to do moving forward? So let me give you a specific example. You're having a hard time in your life with someone. You could say, I need to talk to you about all the issues we're having and blah, 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 blah. And they're not going to be that excited. Or you could say, look, we obviously have some issues. I have my point of view. You have your point of view. Um, we've all been upset. And, you know, there's challenges. Here's the key. We are where we are. I'm sorry for whatever I've done. We are where we are. What's it going to take to move forward? And let's say the other person says, I can't forgive you because, you know, three weeks ago or a year ago, you didn't do this, this, and this. All you have to do is say, I'm sorry. So what would you like to do now? What do we do to move forward and spend way more energy on what we're going to do moving forward rather than reassessing, dissecting, blaming, hashing out the past. If we spent more energy on focusing on the present and the future, we'd have so much more successes. And that's the shift. And I really have found, and I've coached all kinds of people that have worked through and broken through and have breakthroughs with people that they had a really hard time with because they thought they had to dissect the past. And if the past is the past, we are where we're at, what's it going to take to move forward and focus on that and figure out solutions and then actually be accountable to implementing those solutions. 
it's it's kind of the interesting delineation often between coaching and therapy. And I, I, I'm hearing that you often do it in, in, in the team setting where you're helping groups move forward. But the past is important. It has influenced us and we can't change it. And so it adds context. It adds color. Yeah. And and we are future focused to the to a large extent. Would you agree with that? Absolutely. And just think about how often people who have gotten to know themselves, and that's a good thing, will cite themselves and it's an anchor to the past. They'll say, look, you know, I, I've always struggled this in my life, you know, and I um yeah, I, I just don't appreciate people and I, you know, whatever. And I, you know, I I know I can have anger issues and I I know I can be hard to deal with. Well, my point is if you know it, then what are you gonna do about it to move it forward? For somehow <laughs> they some people sometimes share their past as an excuse. And to me, there's no excuse. If you learn it, what are you going to do about it? You know, but sometimes people say, and I, and I find it interesting, there's certain things that when people say we don't really dissect makes no sense. For example, time. You know what? I just need more time. And I'll say to people, look, if time really was the solution to getting past things, nobody would be complaining about how they were brought up. No one would ever complain about their parents, about whatever issues, and I have great parents, but I'm just saying, but people still talk about their childhood and limit their own success. And again, I, it is tough or whatever they've gone through, but you are where you're at and what are you going to do moving forward? So yes, if you understand it, but don't use it as an excuse and an anchor. You can achieve anything you want by focusing on what am I going to do? And here's the other thing. Sometimes our past challenges are actually empower us to be better in the future. Use it as a fuel. I'll give you an example. I was bullied really badly growing up, really badly. Mm -hmm. And the thing about it is, you know, and I suffered from anger and all kinds of stuff. But it taught me things about anger, which now I, I've dealt with and I'm really great with and, you know, just learned about like anger is really sourced back to hurt and fear and then being able to move forward. But the other thing is by being bullied, it helped me. Uh, I have a huge appreciation for people who might be kind of socially awkward or people that don't communicate well. Mm -hmm. So and, and things like that. So I say this because you know, the past can inform us, but we don't want to use it as an anchor. I don't want to say, well, you know, I, you know, I, I would, I, I'm sorry I reacted this way. I was bullied in the past. Well, okay. So what are you going to do about it? You see what I'm saying? Yeah, so I'm a cancer survivor. So I've gone through really tough stuff and I'm saying we all can cite those things, but don't use it as an excuse or a condition as we're talking about. Use it as fuel to move forward and focus. You can get anything achieved that you really set your heart on. I'm not sure if I have this observation right. It's, it's not quite right, but what's on the tip of my tongue right now is you have an ability to be comfortable in the uncomfortable. You have convictions around helping people see a new path forward, which means a paradigm shift for them. Is is comfortable in the uncomfortable the right word? Or what 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 uh... yeah, I love what you said because here's the thing. Yeah. Um, how many how many times as a coach, and I'm sure you've heard this when people go, you know, I, I don't know why I want to do that because I, I, I I'm not comfortable with that. Well, comfortableness is not a sign to stop. It's often a sign that we need to go there. Now, there are extremes, right, where we're uncomfortable, and that's a, a different thing. But I'm saying a lot of times people build an excuse, and they say, well, I'm just not comfortable with that. Or this is not me. Well, get over it. Move out. And I, I mean, here's how I often will say to people about this. Have you ever had a coach or teacher that asked you to do something that in the moment you thought was stupid, ridiculous? You reluctantly did it. And then afterwards, you're like, oh, my gosh, they're so brilliant. That yeah. was spot on. I feel so much better. I can think of so many things in my life I didn't want to do. Somebody pushed me into it, so to speak, you know, or oh, it's not comfortable. And I did it. And I was like, God, they saw something I didn't see in myself. I'm so glad. So sometimes uncomfortableness is not a sign to stop. It's a sign that we need to go exactly in that direction. I think you're delineating between comfort and safety. Just because it's uncomfortable doesn't mean we're not oh, safe to that. try. Yeah. 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 I love yeah. that. Distinguishing comfortability with safety. Absolutely. Yeah. As an executive coach, that, that was a big part of the training is if, if we see things, if we see and hear things that uh, they kind of skirted around an issue there, that's exactly, to your point, what I need to ask about yeah. in an environment, <laughs> right? That I'm not going to go tell their boss or I'm not going to go whatever, yeah. right? It, it's a safe environment to do it. But if you think you should ask about it, you probably should. Now- you know, yeah, yeah, I was going to say, you know, and this is so applicable to just life, what you're just saying, and just dealing with 
everyday folks about that connecting with getting the unsaid said. So somebody might mm -hmm. say, well, I feel like that person's uncomfortable and should I ask it, should I not? I love where you're saying, what you're saying is that's probably the question to ask. And if people get, oh, I get nervous, we'll say that. You could say, look, I, I'm mm -hmm. not sure if I should ask you this. I'm not sure you're okay. And you don't have to answer it. But a question that's coming to mind is X. And that might be the precise question that they need to ask. For example, on the phone, um, I, I was coaching this guy, uh, one of my clients th this morning. And I said, you know, it's interesting. I, I feel like... Um, when we're talking about appreciation, I have a question I want to ask you, and it's pretty kind of, you know, pointed. Do you really appreciate yourself? And have you had a challenging time growing up and just dealing and moving forward in your life with really acknowledging your own successes? And that led to such a wonderful, robust conversation, because obviously that's what he was wrestling with. And many people wrestle with that. And even myself, the idea is what are we going to do moving forward? So sometimes getting the unsaid said can soften or put context to almost anything. Like mm -hmm. if we're asking why, you know, you or ask why, ask why. Well, if you feel uncomfortable, explain why we're asking the why. So the why behind the why. I'm asking you why, because of blah, 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 blah. So we need to ask these questions. It, it's coming back to something in a previous episode that really has my attention right now around intuition. If your gut is telling you, hmm, there's something there, our intuition is so powerful because it's connected to a lot of the unconscious part of our brain, and it's exactly where we need to go and the ability to trust that feeling. Hmm, I should, I, I, I sense I need to ask this client, this thing that I'm noticing it's with the permission to, to either move on or change the subject, whatever we're creating that safe space through that. But um, yeah, that, that, that gut instinct in getting the unsaid said is probably a big part of it. I want to share a really pointed story and a real serious story, but this is hopefully people will always remember the value of asking a question. So I was doing a session, this is some years ago, and this lady was sharing things and saying things that were just, it seemed kind of dark to me. But I didn't, you know, I, I noticed it or whatever and dealt with the questions and we kind of moved forward with the session. At the end of the session, she comes up to me and she continued to go to that place. And something in the back of my mind thought, I wonder if she's going to kill herself. Mm. And so. You know, it's one of those things, do you ask or do you not? So I asked her, I said, look, I, I, I'm just going to ask you a question. I, are, you, are you thinking of killing yourself? And she head jolted back and said, yes. And um, I proceeded to get the HR, you know, my, my client who was an HR person at the time, um, back because she had already left and got security. I walked this lady down to the lobby and it happened to be where her husband was. And I said to her husband, look, you know, I just want you to know your wife has just told me that she's thinking about killing herself. And he looked at me and said, thank you. She's obviously off her meds. Um, we need to take care of her. And, um, and she got help and everything, and everything's fine. So I just say this because, and I sometimes share that story, although how serious it is, because I just think in life, a lot of people notice things, but they just are afraid to ask. And we might be wrong, but it never hurts to ask. I mean, just the other day I was running and I was running um, by a car and there's this little kid in the car and the kid looked, you know, passed out, like sleeping. But I thought, you know, when, with heat, you know, you hear about these things like kids like phones and something bad. So I circled back and there was a guy close and I said, do you know who this car this is? And he said, oh, yeah, it's mine. I said, did you know? And he's like, oh, yeah, yeah, it's all taken care of. You may not hear, but the air conditioning's on. And I said, OK. And then I kept running. Mm -hmm. But what if, you know, so it's a good story. So my, I it turned out everything was fine. But the point is, in life, we often see things, but we just don't ask. And for some reason, there's this whole thing of not getting involved. And I think great people, great friends get involved. They ask the questions. They do what it takes to be supportive. People who really care about other people are really tough with other people. They ask those questions. And the worst somebody could say is, I don't want to answer it. I always tell people, what's the worst anybody could ever say to, uh, you know, the worst case scenario is they say, I don't want to answer it. And you go, okay, but you're never going to know an answer to a question you never ask. Yeah. I feel like that's a great place for us to tie a bow around this conversation, Stephen. I sense I could go a lot longer and, uh, and that's just a really powerful example of going with your gut, stepping into the uncomfortable in service of other people 
a really powerful story. Uh, where can people find you, find the book, the others that you've written? Um, yeah, what would you like to share? So probably the easiest way is to go to our website, justbehonest.com. That's justbehonest.com. And if they say they've listened to the show and, and, and send us an email and, you know, say the, you know, this is what they did with the information or just share something, um, we'll send them the very first book I ever wrote for free. It'll be the electronic version, but it is the first book. It's called Just Be Honest. And Just Be Honest has the, one of the critical distinctions on how do you get the unsaid said. So I'm not trying to sell anybody on it. They can get it for free. And all they have to do is mention your show and say something like how they've used or what they've shared about nice. the show. And, um, and the book, Unconditional Power, will come out September 12th. And so if they want to get on the list and want to, and there's an article I already wrote about it around this, they can start to use some of the content. Just again, email us. And they can find it all by just going to justbehonest.com. All right. Got it. Justbehonest.com. Uh, listeners, Stephen Gaffney, I've learned a lot and I've, you, you've uh, invited me into this space of, of getting the unsaid said, which is really, if I'm not doing that as a coach, then I'm not doing my job. And so I really thank you for that. That's going to nudge me forward. And thanks for spending the time with us today. Thanks for having me. Thanks for listening to Leading with Curiosity. Please share, follow, and rate the show so that other leaders can make positive change in the world. Connect with Nate at natelesley.ca. And remember, the brain behaves very differently when encouraged to think rather than told to listen. <laughs>